I've been a Fire Emblem nut since Fire Emblem 7 was first released in America. I was always huge on strategy and puzzle games as a kid, and when I picked up this game because of the cool box art, let's be honest, that's what we all did when we were in middle school, I was enthralled by its difficulty and the way it made you build an attachment to your characters. It was high stakes enough to get me invested, but slow paced enough for me to feel responsible for anything that went wrong. After Path of Radiance and Radiant Dawn, there was a considerable lull in Fire Emblem titles, or even news, aside from the re-release of Shadow Dragon. At first, I was worried the niche series hadn't sold well enough to warrant further releases. Now, this was before I was actively involved in game news and journalism, so my teenage brain didn't quite grasp that the series had considerable popularity in Japan. I filled the void by emulating the Japanese-only titles, but a dark cloud still loomed over the franchise. Then, suddenly, Awakening. Announced just before its release, Awakening seemed to make the biggest splash the series had ever seen. Major news publications were now paying attention. Friends who had never touched the games now declared themselves fans, and for the first time, a small Nintendo series had enough Rule 34 to combat the likes of Mario. Unfortunately, Awakening was only released on the 3DS, a console I didn't own. Since I was now an adult, I had very little money to spend on frivolous things like games because I was entirely responsible for myself and it was time to move on. So after Mommy got me a 3DS for my birthday, I looked through the games I was starting with. Ocarina of Time 3D, eh, eh, Kingdom Hearts 3D, maybe, Pokemon Y, <laughs> god no. Fire Emblem Awakening, yes. After A Link Between Worlds. For about a month, Awakening kept me company on the subway to and from work, rehearsals, and crime scenes. I sunk about 50 hours into it before completing, and I did all the paralogues except for the last batch before I beat Grema. And I was... underwhelmed. You know, looking back on it, I can't say I was disappointed because the game was bad, but afterwards I felt like I had accomplished very little. You know, whereas I deserved a goddamn medal for finishing the other Fire Emblems. So, because I'm a dick, it's time to overanalyze it. Awakening definitely does things that are worthy of praise. It's one of the better looking and sounding games on the 3DS, and one of the few I've played where the 3D has been genuinely pleasant to look at. Beyond that, the support system is the deepest it's ever been. Sort of. I'll get to that later. The characters are often hilarious and sometimes moving, though a lot of the serious moments come with a lot of schmaltz. The main storyline is really cheesy. I mean really cheesy. Fire Emblem stories have never been anything too special, but the constant friendship speeches Chrome gives are over the top, even for this series. It's not really a big deal, however, because, you know, as I said, they were never really Pulitzer-worthy in the first place. Where the writing does excel is in the support conversations. This is arguably the most entertaining the characters have ever been. Donald and Pan's S-rank conversations come to mind as particularly hilarious. Yeah, the supports are also wildly accessible. Unlike previous games, there's no limit on the amount of support conversations each character can have. This means you don't have to start the game over 50 times in order to see all the conversations. Instead of having characters you want to support spend dozens of turns standing next to each other, the conversations are now unlocked by battling together, which is easiest to do by pairing up. Pairing up is an entirely new feature, where two units combine giving each other stat boosts and sometimes even lending extra attacks. This is where the game's design starts to bother me a bit. Pairing up fundamentally changes the way Fire Emblem works. You know, in previous games, every facet of every move you made mattered. It wasn't just making sure you kept your archers out of melee range or making sure you used the right weapon. The position of every unit on the map mattered. Every unit was frail, and even the strongest of them could be taken out in one round if left too vulnerable. Forming walls and baiting opponents into positions where you had the upper hand were just some of many vital techniques to learn if you wanted to make it through without losing a fighter. Various games also expanded on it. When the early games added rescuing, it provided a way to get units in danger out of dodge, but at the cost of burdening the unit rescuing them. Path of Radiance added the shove mechanic, which brought more depth to the placement of units by letting you give up a unit's turn in order to push another unit into a more advantageous spot. All of these additions gave you more to consider, as each has risk and reward. On the other hand, pairing up removes at least half the strategy in the game. In virtually any battle, you now have the upper hand, as it's always two of your stat-boosted units against one normal enemy. Protecting frail units is as simple as pairing up an archer or mage with a knight who will take the attacks even more efficiently than usual. It becomes much less important to use the right weapon or the right unit, and it becomes purely about the stats and abilities in play. Even the bosses are easily outclassed by your paired units. Even the final boss is laughably easy compared to other final bosses, such as Ashnard, due to the pairing system. Further adding to this is the watering down of the magic system. Magic has always changed in each installment of the series, but in general it contains some level of weapon triangle system just like the Sword Axe Lance Trinity. For example, in one installment, light magic was strong against dark magic, dark was strong against anima, and anima was strong against light. In another, each of the anima magics had a specific strength. Fire dealt bonus damage to Laguz, thunder to dragons and wyverns, and wind to bird and pegasi. 
In Awakening, magic has no strength or weakness, aside from wind still being effective against flying units. A mage's effectiveness has now been stripped down purely to their stats. This by itself isn't too big of a deal. After all, when the series started, it didn't even really have weapon triangles. But Awakening has a habit of making sure your stats are through the roof. Each unit can change classes over and over again, meaning you can get everybody's stats to obscene heights and never hit a level cap. When they get to 20, you just class change them and start building stats again. As I said earlier, supports are unlimited, and that means you can have your units constantly getting support bonuses from up to 5 units at once if everybody's positioned correctly. In earlier games, you only had a few supports per character, which meant you had to spend them wisely. You had to figure out which characters provided the stat boost you wanted, along with making sure that they could be by each other to give those boosts without being too vulnerable. In Awakening, there's no reason not to support everybody with everybody else. They'll likely have at least an aim rank support with the unit you pair them up with, which makes pairing up even more overpowered. Pairing up also replaces rescuing. If one unit gets hurt too badly, all you have to do is just switch their partner to the front. You can get them out of the battle with barely any risk, since they'll still be helping to defend their partner if they get attacked on the way out. The game also constantly gives you items through the barracks. The barracks aren't a new feature, as they were included in Path of Radiance, but there's a marked difference. In Path of Radiance, the barracks events were limited, as you were on a linear path through the game. In Awakening, you get several daily, which means a constant flow of items, relationship boosts, stat boosts, and experience for free. This goes hand in hand with another reused but adapted game mechanic, Battles Against the Risen. In Sacred Stones, wild groups of enemies would pop up on the map in places you've fought before, giving you a chance to fight them for extra experience. Awakening takes this and makes it more player-friendly. In Sacred Stones, all the enemies you would fight were monsters that attacked with claws, eye lasers, and other unconventional weapons. This meant you couldn't get any drops from them, and you had to decide whether or not the extra experience was worth wearing down the durability on your weapons. In Awakening, there's no downside to fighting the Risen. Almost all of them use standard weapons, and some of them will drop those weapons when defeated, making up for the durability you lost to kill them in the first place. On top of this, they also drop money, when gold has previously been an immensely precious resource that you had to manage well. I naturally hoard my items like crazy in Fire Emblem, but in Awakening, I had loads of weapon in my convoy by the end of the game, and enough gold to buy everything in the shops ten times over, and I hadn't even been trying to conserve either. Resource management is, for the first time, not an issue in a Fire Emblem game. So, let's talk about the marriage system. This is actually what had me most excited for Awakening. The marriage system and genealogy of the Holy War was one of the chief reasons it sits as my favorite Fire Emblem game. Like most recycled elements in Awakening, the marriage and offspring system has some marked differences from the one in genealogy. The biggest difference is that, in Awakening, both the parents and children are in the same army. See, in genealogy, the parents you hooked up in the first part of the game would produce your child army for the second part. As such, the decisions you made would drastically affect the way you played the second part. In Awakening, once you get a couple to S-rank and support conversations, you unlock a paralogue or side chapter to get the child tied to that mother. The father affects the hair color, skills, and specific stats of the child, but the personality and class remain locked. They are then in your army along with all the adults due to plot magic, and it's impressive how much detail intelligent systems put into setting up support conversations with all the different fathers the children could have. Getting the support levels up is overkill though, because holy crap the children are overpowered! They're by far stronger than the parents before, and there's no reason not to make up your team entirely out of them. They all start with some extra skills, most of them crazy good skills like Soul or Astra, and they only get more. Unlike past games where each character had an allotted amount of skill points to make sure they didn't have all the game-breaking abilities, you can have five skills for each person here, regardless of how good the skills are. So whereas Genealogy used the marriage system to decide what your next army would look like, the marriage system in Awakening basically just adds incredibly powerful units to your already burgeoning roster. Awakening replaces most of its challenging gameplay systems with systems that constantly award the player for no real reason, with no risk involved. This isn't inherently bad, it's just a different kind of game than I expected from Fire Emblem. I had a hard time placing my finger on why it felt so different until I got to the paralogue where you have to defend Tiki. In this chapter, you have to build a wall with your units. Even though this is a common strategy in earlier games, I realized that I had gone pretty much the entire game unconcerned with exactly how my units were placed. Suddenly, there was risk. I couldn't have my units paired up or I wouldn't be able to make a wall big enough to protect Tiki, which meant I had to build the wall in a way that would protect my own units as well while still being able to take out wave after wave of approaching enemies with both melee and ranged weapons. My healers and archers were now in the open, and even though I had to have them assist, I also had to keep them out of harm's way. There was a glimmer of that difficulty that pulled me into Fire Emblem in the first place. That incredibly punishing, thrilling feeling that you might lose one of those units that you've invested time and resources in. It wasn't as difficult as most Path of Radiance levels, but it felt like a strategy game again. Hell, up to that point I had to make all of my own challenges. For example, never using Frederick until I hit chapters in the late 20s, then using him in every battle and trying to keep him alive. It's a medieval Nuzlocke challenge, trust me. In Awakening, 
The focus shifted from strategy to RPG elements like stat building and waifu simulating, which is largely why it was so successful. It's not exactly a secret that the blistering difficulty frustrated and turned away a lot of gamers who tried earlier titles, but it was also that difficulty and depth of strategy that earned the series so many of its diehard fans. Awakening is still a good game. I enjoyed it, and I'll probably play it again in the future, but I'd be lying if I said I wasn't disappointed by how watered down it felt compared to every other entry in the franchise. I'm happy that the sacrifices they made to appeal to a broader audience earned them enough sales to keep the franchise around, but there's still a part of me that insists that adding casual modes should have been enough. In reality, bringing back dead units after each chapter wouldn't help if the player couldn't get through the level in the first place, so going as far as they did really was the only thing that made sense from a business perspective. After all, the reason I've been able to go back and play every Fire Emblem game and still enjoy it was the fact that each entry introduced changes to shake up the formula. It was just disheartening to me that all the changes in Awakening take away from the gameplay's depth rather than add to it. I hope future entries in the franchise will go back to the old method of expanding the game's strategy elements in an attempt to ease the newfound audience into the more punishing Fire Emblem traditions. They wouldn't even need to get rid of pairing up because it's not inherently flawed. It's more that it's only at your disposal. Honestly, if in the next Fire Emblem, the enemies could also pair up, that would actually add a lot of depth to it. Suddenly, huge mobs of enemies would actually be a lot more intimidating. You couldn't just approach them as gung-ho as you could in Awakening. Since the pairing up system in Awakening was received so well, I wouldn't be surprised if they keep something like that around. I just hope that they take it and make it deeper, and more challenging, instead of the way that it worked in Awakening, which basically removed all of the strategy and challenge. However, the pessimistic side of me, due in part to the fact that most Awakening players thought Frederick was a good unit, is worried that they've given up on high-risk gameplay that rewards strategic thinking in favor of the more commercially successful style that many modern gamers are used to. No risk, all reward. If you liked my little rambling thoughts on game design, you should also check out the video I did for Evoland, right over here. If you want to see any of the stuff I do outside of my game videos, here's my sketch comedy channel, Harmpit Productions, as well as my personal page where I post my acting stuff, such as Cyberpunch, a short film, and my acting reels. Alright, thank you for watching.